Come on, we had a big week as a church, and I know we've been celebrating XYC, but can I just take a moment and say something? I had the opportunity to go down and preach on Wednesday, and uh, man, the students, what God's doing in the life of our students is just incredible. Can I just tell you, God is moving. Like, if any of you parents know, if your kid came back, is like fired up, it was amazing. But I also left that evening with this overwhelming sense of gratitude for a group of people that are kind of like unsung heroes. Can, I, can we just take a moment, I wanna address them. And that is, I left so very grateful for all of the youth leaders that would take off of work. Do you realize that there are, if you got parents, if you got someone that went down there, your kids go down there, We've got these amazing youth leaders and they take a week of vacation, their own time, to go down and invest in our other kids that aren't even theirs. Like, it just blew me away and I just thought, these are some servant leaders that are often overlooked into how much they make a difference. And so, we're just fired up and excited. We believe in the next generation in this church and that's why we invest so much into XYC, okay? So, really grateful for that. And if you are new to our church, man, I'm wel welcome, I'm glad you're here. And uh, we've been talking for the last couple weeks about a guy from the Old Testament, kind of an ancient guy who lived around 900 BC. His name is Elisha, and he was known as a prophet. And the prophet was somebody that God would speak to, and then he would tell a message to the people. Oftentimes it would be of something that was going to happen in the future. And so Elisha not only did that, but God used Elisha to do some of the most incredible miracles that we read about in the Old Testament. And it's like, as you follow his story, it's one highlight after another uh, of just God anointed him and then used him to do incredible miracles. And as we've been going through the series, can I tell you what my prayer has been for our community? And it's kind of been something even in my own life. And that is, I'm, I'm really just praying and hoping that our faith is built through this series. I'm hoping that maybe many of you that if you showed up and, and you're kind of your faith has been up and down in life, here's been my prayer is that you are just, your, your faith is swelling, that you're starting to believe God for maybe something you've prayed for and you quit praying for it because nothing happens and nothing ever happens when you pray and so I don't think God actually doing anything. Well, I hope hearing the stories of what God has done can inspire you to believe for what God can do. Because I'm not just someone who believes God did miracles. Hello? I'm someone who believes God does miracles. Anybody else here? Like, I, I wanna be the kind of person that, look, I don't wanna go through life, people think faith is having like wishful thinking. It's just like believing for the best, hoping it turns out. That's not what faith is. I wanna live in the real world but I wanna believe in a very real God that can change the real world. And that's kind of what my hope and prayer has been throughout this series. And here's the thing about Elisha, here's a guy who served God, people called him a holy man. I mean, he, he was kind of God's mouthpiece at the time, did significant miraculous things to prove it, and yet in all of the things he did in serving others, Elisha had his own problems too. And I don't know if you know this, but you can serve God and you can live the best life you can and you can try to like, I'm gonna just gonna follow all the rules and I'm gonna follow God and I'm gonna love God and I'm gonna serve people. You know you can do all the good things in this world and still have really bad things happen to you? Like you understand that, right? Just because you decide maybe to follow him and, and honor him with your life doesn't mean that you're not gonna face insurmountable odds at times. In fact, I don't know if any of you, maybe some of you are at that place today, but have you ever been overwhelmed by a situation in life? My guess is most of us have. Has there ever been a time in your life where you just felt like the walls were kind of caving in on you or the sky was falling and you, you really didn't know which way was up or down, you didn't know how to get out of the situation? Like some of you, maybe you're, you're in that place right now with work and Maybe some of you lost your job and your savings account is dwindling and you're just not even sure that you're gonna be able to make it. I'm not sure how we're gonna pay the bills. Or maybe your business, everything is drying up and you're at the verge of like having to close the doors and you don't know how you're gonna survive. Or it could be some of you, and I, I know this situation, these exist, you, parents, where you got kids and you're watching them go through some kind of horrible mental health crisis and you've tried everything you can and counselors and all this and nothing is working, it's overwhelming. You feel like there's no way out. 
Maybe you're dealing with your own medical problem right now and the doctors are, they're not giving a whole lot of hope and you're trying this treatment or you just found out a loved one is battling a disease and they may not make it. I'm just telling you like, life comes at you sometimes and you can be so overwhelmed. Some of you showed up here and they're singing and everybody seems like they're so happy but you've just been in a state of depression lately. I don't know if you've ever experienced depression, but I have. And I'm kind of one of these people that like my emotions, I don't, I'm not an up and down kind of person. Like I don't have high highs and I don't have low lows. Like I'm, I'm like steady Eddie. Like anybody like me, just like boom, you know? Sometimes my staff think I don't have any emotions because I'm so like just consistent and routine, but I do. But I'm just like steady and consistent, you know? Nothing gets me too riled up and nothing, you know? I'm just kind of right in the middle. But I've, I can look back at my life and I've had two seasons where I would say I, I walk through what, what often people call the dark night of the soul or going through a valley experience where you, you feel like you're depressed. The first time it really happened to me was my first year of full-time ministry. Here, here I was making a decision for God. I'm gonna leave my career in the marketplace. I'm going into ministry. We had a small church, like believe in God for big things. You know, you think this, take this huge step of faith and all of a sudden, all right, here we go. God is with you. Couple months in and I felt like, God, where are you? Like I, I, I felt like I didn't know where God was. I didn't know what I was doing. Up was down, left was right. I, I felt so frustrated with life. I felt like I was frustrated with God. I was frustrated with myself. I lost my appetite. I lost 25 pounds in a couple months. Some people are like, that's a great diet. I know, it, it is, but I don't ever wanna be depressed to get there. Like it was, it was such a dark season to walk through. And sometimes when you find yourself in a place like that, you just, you just feel overwhelmed. You feel like there's no way out. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. What I've discovered is even serving God, it can happen to you. Even loving God, it can happen to you. Even trying to do the right things, it can happen to you. And it happened to Elisha. Elisha had some times where he just was completely surrounded. What would be an overwhelming situation that looks impossible. And if you've been in a place like that, or if you're not, Thank God, I would encourage you, take notes today because we will all end up in a place like this at some point. And what do I do when I'm in that place? I think we can learn from Elisha today. And so do you have your Bible? Go ahead and get it out. If you've got it, we're gonna pick up Elisha's story in 2 Kings chapter six. Now, if you don't have your Bible with you, can I really encourage you to download our app? And even if you do have it, use it as a companion as we've got message notes on there and I've got things from our talk today that are gonna be in there that'll help you remember. And it'll help you just kind of reflect on the scripture that we're looking at. So 2 Kings chapter six, starting at verse eight. Let's look at this story and see how God can use it to illuminate our faith. In verse eight, it says, now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. And after conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. And time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. And this enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and he demanded of them, tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Now, this is just an amazing moment, okay? I, I find this fascinating where Israel and Aram are at war. And so the king of Aram, he comes up with these brilliant military strategies, it's like, man, we're gonna go through this pass and we're gonna sneak around. They never expect us. We're gonna go over there, camp there, and then we're gonna attack them and we'll catch them by surprise. And every time he's got this military strategy of what he's gonna do, God speaks to Elisha what the king is planning in his head and with his military leaders to do, and he warns the king of Israel. So the king of Israel moves the army around and they're playing this little game of like, you know, chess and and. 
And Israel has the upper hand because of Elisha. And the king of Aram, finally, he is just like, he's just beside himself. He gets so mad. And he finally realizes, I think we have a mole. We got a mole, right? And so he gets all his commanders together. He's all right, which one of you is the traitor? Who's the mole in the camp, right? And one of the guys speaks up and says, sir, sir, seriously, we don't have a mole. They've got an Elisha, all right? This dude's crazy. God speaks to him, tells him things. He knows what you're thinking, right? And so this is what happens. a funny situation. Then the king of Aram, when he discovers this, this is what he says in verse 13. He says, go and find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He's in Dothan. Then the king sent horses and chariots and a strong force there, and they went by night, and they surrounded the city. All right, I don't know if you see irony in this, but I do. Okay, Elisha has an ability to see into the future. God gives it to him. He can tell every move the king of Aram is making, except this one. It's funny, right? Every place the king is going, Elisha knows it. And the king thinks to himself, you know what? I'm gonna go get Elisha. So he finds out where he is, sends an army to surround the city where Elisha is, and guess what? Elisha was in the city. And so I found this really ironic that Elisha doesn't see the one thing that he needs to see that's coming at him. And in a weird way, I thought to myself, isn't that kind of how it works in life? Have you ever noticed how it seems like we can often see other things so clearly in other people that we can never see in ourselves? Isn't that true? Have you ever noticed like you can see with incredible foresight when you watch somebody else, you see somebody else's kid being crazy and you think to yourself, man, if I were that kid's parent, I could take care of this. I love it when single people or people who don't have any kids know exactly how to parent, but they've never had a kid. You know what I'm talking about, parents, right? It's like, it's like oh, or, or when you see somebody and they make a purchase and you look at them, you're like, oh, that was so dumb. You ever just thought that in your head? You look at somebody and you just like smile and they're showing you what they got and you're like, that's depreciated already, 25%. And if you were smart, you would have done it this way, you know? Because you can see everything so clearly and so perfect when everybody else gets it so wrong. You see every opportunity that they missed, right? Isn't it interesting that we have foresight when we look at other people, but we always look at our own life with hindsight? Oh yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that. That was dumb, what was I thinking, right? It's, it's so amazing that we can see clearly with others, but we can't see. Now, I don't know if Elisha couldn't really tell or see if God didn't tell him. I don't know. But for whatever reason, Elisha's in the city. It's nighttime. And the king of Aram sends a military to surround the entire city, and Elisha is stuck inside. Now, what happens in the morning is interesting. Verse 15, when the servant of the man of God got up, he went out early the next morning. And an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do, the servant asked. Now, sometimes I think when we read the Bible, we can do it so boring. I think it's important you slow down and just don't read over things like it's, okay, this is something that just happened, but actually pause and reflect on it for a moment. You know, I, I like to picture what's going on, okay? They wake up in the morning and you know, and Elisha and his servant, they're staying maybe in a tent or who knows what, and the servant wakes up first thing, he's half asleep, you know, he goes outside the tent looking for a bush to pee, right, because isn't that what you do when you wake up first thing in the morning, right, okay? So I imagine he's up there, he's rubbing his eye, I got pee, you know, like all this good stuff, and the moment he like opens his eyes, boom, there's horses, chariots, Men with swords, spears, standing right in front of them. Now what would you do if that happened, if your enemy was right in front of you and had you surrounded, right? Scripture tells us that he says, oh no, my Lord. I bet that's how you'd say it too, isn't it? <laughs> oh shoot, this is bad. See, here's where sometimes, can I tell you, this is what I do. You don't have to do this because this is what I do, but I like to study the original language because sometimes I'm reading it and I'm thinking these Bible translators kind of sanitize it a little bit because it's gotta be in the Bible, right? 
The actual Hebrew word is a little bit more than, oh no, my Lord. You know, it's, it's got a little more intensity. You know, we, we might say, oh crap, right? And some of you wouldn't have even said that. I just had to kind of PG it for church. But how many of you have ever had an oh crap moment? I mean, like, you ever had one of those moments where you're just going along life and everything is good, and then all of a sudden, oh crap, it's, right? We say sometimes the crap hit the fan, sometimes we use a different word, right? But the, I think that's what he's really saying here. This is, this is bad. Like, I have found that sometimes this is what life feels like. That, that you can just be going along and everything is fine. And you know, you're not fighting with your spouse or everything is fine at work and your job is secure and you're paying your bills and your kids are healthy and they're doing all right in school and they've got good grades and you're able to go on vacation. And life can, I don't know if this ever happened to you, but you can just be going along smooth sailing and then all it takes is one phone call with a voicemail on your phone and it changes everything. One text message you never anticipated getting and your world gets wrecked. That's the way it happens, by the way. It always happens in just a moment when you're unsuspecting, where all of a sudden you wake up one day and you feel surrounded. You get the worst news ever, and you feel overwhelmed, you feel surrounded, and you lose hope. Last week, at the end of the message, we gave an opportunity for people to get prayer. And we had the prayer team come out and staff and. I jumped down and just prayed with some people. And it reminded me that a, a lot of people in our community come to church every Sunday living in oh crap moments. I prayed with one woman who um, was just emotionally a wreck because her husband wanted a divorce. and She has her kids and she's trying to figure out how to survive and how to make it now with her whole world changed. See, you, you don't get prepared for that. Nobody prepares you for stuff like that. One of our pastors prayed with a woman in our church community whose husband just lost his job while they're dealing with an illness and they have medical bills that they can't pay. That's so crap. That's surrounded. I prayed with a, a young lady that came down that was estranged from one of her parents, just broken emotionally. This is, this is a fraction. We prayed with people who are having med medical problems and need help and don't know what to do. And this is life. You can serve God, love God, do the best with your life. You'll still have oh crap moments like Elisha did because this is real. And so the servant wakes up freaked out, feeling surrounded. Now I imagine that Elisha, maybe he's in the tent, he hasn't come out. He hears the commotion, maybe he's gotta pee, I don't know, but Elisha shows up next. Look at, with me, if you would, at verse 16. When Elisha comes out and looks, here's what he says. He says, don't be, what? Say it out loud, don't be, don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. He immediately sees the army around him, Overwhelmed, and he says, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, I don't know what kind of math Elisha does. I don't think this is girl math, but maybe it's God math. I don't know, because all I know is there's two of them, and the whole city is surrounded by an army with, with chariots and horses. I mean, you're, you're outnumbered, you're outmanned, you're outgunned. And the first thing Elisha says, can you imagine the goal of Elisha? He looks at his servant, he says, ah, don't be afraid. Don't sweat this, what's wrong with you? Why are you getting so upset? And there's something about that phrase, don't be afraid, that I find so curious. Because um, in Christian circles in the church, it feels like that phrase to me sometimes makes a really good bumper sticker, but is kind of a really difficult thing to live out. Isn't it true? Y'all remember back in, I don't know if it was the 90s, if you're that old, the 2000s, everybody had bumper stickers and they had th window clings that said no fear or fear not, I've seen them all. You know, all this idea, it's like, 
it, it all goes back to this, this idea of don't be afraid. And, and that sounds great, and I'm always really cautious though, even as a pastor, when, I, when I'm counseling somebody, ministering to somebody, praying with somebody, when they tell me their situation and it looks bleak and it's like we don't have enough money in the account, hey, don't be afraid, it's all good. There's more in your account than there is bills coming in. And that's what Elisha said, isn't it? I, I'm real cautious, not that I don't have faith, but I think sometimes it feels like let's put a, a spiritual Band-Aid on something that's way bigger than that. That's what it feels like to me. And yet here's what I also know to be true. When I look throughout scripture, the single command that is given to us more than any other command is this one, don't be afraid. More than 200 times do you find in scripture this command of don't be afraid. And here's what's so funny. Every single time God or one of his prophets is saying don't be afraid, Get what? guess what? They had every reason in the world to be afraid. They did. I was thinking about like the Israelites when they left Egypt and finally through all those 10 plagues and God sets them free and God leads them into the wilderness, one of the first places he leads them is right to the Red Sea and they show up and they're like, there's a huge massive sea in front of them and there's mountains all around them and there's only one way in and one way out and they turn around and the moment they turn around they realize that the king of Egypt changed his mind and now there's an entire army pressing in and they were surrounded and guess what Moses said? Don't be afraid. Stand firm and watch the hand of God. Okay, I'm, this is pretty scary though. They, get, they reach us, we're dead, right? Or, or think about Joshua. God had to say this to Joshua when he was leading the Israelites into the promised land and they're scared to death and there's walled cities and there's giants in the land and God speaks to Joshua who's scared to death and says, don't be afraid. Come on, have courage, what's wrong with you? Or I think about the disciples when they're in the boat with Jesus and there's this massive storm and Jesus decided to take a nap and he's sleeping on a cushion and they're gonna die so they wake him up and Jesus gets up and he says, stop, don't be afraid. Just have faith. And you're like, what do you mean by this? Because every time we hear that or see it in scripture, they, were, they had every reason to be afraid. Now here's what's interesting. When God calls us, commands us to not be afraid, it's in the very same situations where everything you are wired for and designed for is to respond in fear. Now, I, I don't know, you know, your viewpoint on humans and how we got here. I don't really care. We could argue and debate. I don't, it doesn't matter. If you believe in evolution, believe in God created things, here's what I know. Our bodies are designed to naturally respond to fear in a specific way. They're designed that way, okay? Or at least they give the appearance of design regardless of what you believe. But there's this thing, this mechanism in us that when we perceive threat, whether it's real or not, all of a sudden your body starts producing things like adrenaline and cortisol and, and it's to cause you to react in that moment. And typically we've said that there's two primary ways we all respond to a threat. It's fight or flight, right? In other words, when you feel backed into a corner, okay, even if it's a bigger army than you, you're either gonna come out swinging or you're gonna try to run for your life. I'm thinking about Elisha's situation. There's way more of them and they've got weapons than Elisha and his servant. I don't know if fighting would do them any good. They should escape. Oh, that's right, the city was surrounded. What do you do when neither of those options worked? Maybe, this is what scripture calls us to, is a third option. And this is the hardest one because it's not natural. I wonder if it even takes a supernatural response and that is by faith. These are the moments in our lives, the oh crap moments, these are the moments that call for faith. This is where faith lives. And what I've found is that it's really easy to have faith when life is good. Let's be honest, right? It's like when life is good and the family's good and work's good and kids are good and we're safe and everything's fine in my world, it's easy to have faith, you know? I just trust God, God is good all the time and all the time, God is good. We say all these things, it sounds great, right? It's easy to believe, but what happens when you're surrounded? What happens when you have an oh crap moment? I'm supposed to have faith, right? But I do think that there's something about these kind of moments 
the hardest moments in life that God wants to show us who he really is. And this is what Elisha in this moment recognizes. Look at, let me show you this verse, verse 17. It says, and Elisha prays a prayer. What was his prayer? He said, open his what? Say it out loud. Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes. And he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And I found this interesting because Elisha prays in this moment. And that's what we do sometimes. We have oh crap moment. But Elisha doesn't pray for God to show up. He doesn't pray for God to take out his enemy. Here's what he prays. He prays, God, open his eyes so that he can see you're already here. And most of the time when we feel surrounded, if we're honest, we don't feel like God is there. When there is no way out, when I don't know how I'm gonna survive this, it's in these moments that we feel like I don't know where to go and what to turn to and I don't even know if God is there. And this is the struggle with faith. This is where it gets hard. Faith is that ability to kind of believe even if you can't see. And that's so hard today because, let's be honest, we, we live in an environment, we live in an age where we're told the only thing that is real is that which you can perceive with your senses. That's what we're told. The only thing that's real is what you, like what, what are your senses, right? The, the only thing, if you hear it, you can know it's real. If you taste it, you know it's real. If you can touch it, you know it's real, right? If you can see it, you know it's real. If you can smell it, you know it's real. So what's this thing about faith? I wonder if what scripture calls us to do when it comes to faith is actually trust in something greater than your physical senses. In fact, there's this one scripture I wanted to show you, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. This is a command of scripture that is so powerful that I think we, we need to memorize this. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, for we live by what? Say it out loud. We live by, not by what? Okay, here's what I want us to do. I want us all to say this verse together out loud. If you forget everything else you hear today, maybe you at least memorize a small verse that you can put in your back pocket for the next time you get into a situation where you feel overwhelmed. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, say it with me. For we live by faith, not by sight. What does it mean to live by faith and not by sight? It means don't trust your eyes. Don't trust what you see. Now we live in an age scientifically where we're told you only trust what you see. You can't believe in God, you can't see God, you can't prove God. Having faith in God is dumb. We only trust in what we can see and smell and taste and feel and hear. This is what we trust the physical senses in our physical world, that's what lets us know what is real. Well, I'd argue, I, I don't know, I'd question that maybe. In fact, let's, Let's take a moment and let's think about this logically and scientifically. One of the most fascinating designs in your body is your eyes. Your eyes. Like one of the debates that has long existed between whether you believe in evolution and things just happen by random process, natural selection, or if there was an agent, a creator that made us specifically is the human eye. And here's the challenge, right? The human eye is so marvelly complex. It's one of the most complicated and beautiful machines that exist in our world today. We know what we know about cameras because of the human eye. Like it's a technology that has existed for a really long time that we just can't even fathom the brilliance of it. And so there's this question, did things just all evolve together, all the parts of this to work, or did God create it? It's a great question, right? But let's talk about the human eye for a moment. I brought a little diagram just maybe help because I thought you wanted to go to biology class today and it would be really helpful. I don't think Elisha had biology class, but we do, and so it can help us. You know, the eyes help you see, and so whatever you see around you, the light from what's around you as it is captured through the lens of your eye, that light gets focused by your lens to a spots in the back of the eye. And in the back of the eye, there's a thin layer of tissue that lines the back of the eye that's called the retina, okay? 
And as light gets focused in and hits this thin layer of tissue, there are cells in this tissue that are called photoreceptors, okay? We have two different types of photoreceptor cells. cells. I know some of you hate biology. There's not a test on this later, but it will be helpful, I trust me, okay? There's two types, so if you are a note taker, you're like, all right, two types of photoreceptor cells. Okay, two types of photoreceptor cells. You've probably heard of this. There are rods and there are cones, okay? Some of you know this. They have rods and cones. Now the rods, these type of cells in your eye, actually uh, help you perceive the amount of, of, of dimness or how bright something is. The rods help you kind of focus in on how bright, how dark, okay, shading. The cones specifically help you understand or see light. And between the two of them, it helps paint a picture. And so what happens is when the wavelength of light hits the photoreceptors, specifically these cones, there are three types of cones that you have in the back of your eye. Again, marvelously complex, right? Just amazing. Three types of cones that you have in the back that are each kind of excited by different wavelengths of light. These three different types are considered, and I have to fix this because the last experience, I forgot to say the primary colors of light. There's a difference between the primary colors that we teach, and I was talking about the primary colors of light. There are three primary colors of light, and these are the three cells, the photoreceptor cones that you have. One is affected, and it does the red, one does the blue, and one does the green. Okay, these are the primary colors of physics or light, red, blue, green. Every monitor that you, computer monitor, TV monitor, was done out of red, blue, green because that's what we see, all right? And as energy, light, wavelengths excite them, they send a signal down the optical nerve to your brain that paints the picture that we see of the color and the shading from the rods and the cones. Are you following me? Did I lose it? All right, I lost, okay. Don't worry about all that. Just here's what I'm trying to say. It's a marvel in the way we're created. Now, as we understand this and our ability to kind of make things out visually and see, here's what you need to know. Light is not just like a shine, a flashlight. Just, light is part of something much bigger that we call the electromagnetic spectrum. It's radiation and energy, okay? The electromagnetic spectrum. In fact, I've got a little uh, chart to put this up because again, we're at science class. I know this will be really helpful. Okay, energy, all energy, all radiation that comes to us is part of this spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum. The longer waves that you see all the way, okay, there's like real long waves or radio waves all the way to the really kind of like fast, excited ones or gamma rays and things like this. Now, here's what you need to know. This is all that matters. What we see, the rainbow of colors of visible light is only .0035% of all radiation that's around us. So here's what this means. You and I only see a fraction of a hundredth of a percent of what is actually around us. That's all we see. And if we go by this idea that only what is real is what we can perceive with our senses, we're actually missing what is very real all around us. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, we're surrounded by things that we cannot see that are just as real as what we do see. For example, you ever put food into a microwave at your house and you'd set it and you don't see anything happen, but when you go pull the food out, it's hot, it's because there's microwaves okay, that are actually heating up the food. You just can't see it, but there's really waves of energy happening. This is why, you know this, if you get on a plane and you go to Florida this week and you decide, I'm gonna lay out at the beach, and so you go to the beach and you don't put any sunblock on and you lay out for eight hours straight thinking this is so beautiful. What's gonna happen to you? You're gonna look like a fried lobster. And guess what you're gonna discover? UV rays are real. You get me? I'm saying there are things around us every day that we cannot see with our eyes, but it does not mean it's not real, just as real as what we do see. I was reminded of this on May 10th. On May 10th, I was sitting at home, it was late at night, it was like 10.30 at night, 
and my wife was driving home, I don't remember where she was, and uh, she was messaging me, and I was on my phone, and I just happened to be looking on Instagram, I got on it, and while I'm on there, I see like everybody posting these crazy pictures of the sky at night. They're like, it's beautiful purples and pinks and greens and this gorgeous hue of light in the sky. And I didn't even know anything was going on. I knew nothing about coronal mass ejections and solar storms. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't just living my life, you know. It's nighttime, it's dark. And, and I'm looking at people, I'm like, dang, that's, where, where they live? That's pretty, old. wait, they live right here. Hold on, this doesn't make sense, you know. And my wife came in just about then and she said, have you seen the pictures people are posting? I said, yeah. She said, there's somebody standing right out at the end of our driveway, and they're looking up at the sky, and it's like, like it, I guess it's crazy out. I'm like, we got to go out and see this. So I go outside on my back deck, and I look up, and, and I, here's a picture. This is kind of what I saw. I was like, okay. I don't know. Looks the same as every other night. And I see some stars, kind of dark. I don't know, I don't know, I don't understand. Why are some people seeing this and I'm not seeing it? I don't know, I didn't see it, so I came back inside. I said, honey, you can't see it. Like, I don't know, don't say it. She said, wait, wait, this is weird, I, I, I drove by them when I came in, but they were all looking through their phone. I was like, I don't know, do you have to use your phone or something? Like, that makes no sense, why would the phone be able to say? She was like, I don't know, but I think you gotta use your phone or something. So then I went back outside and I grabbed my phone and I opened up the camera app and then I held up the camera app and I looked up in the sky and this is what I saw. You mean that was there the whole time, but I couldn't see it? Why is it that that was there the whole time, but I couldn't see it? It's because I needed a different lens. The lens that I was looking through would not permit me to see that. But your camera's lens has technology that it absorbs more light and it keeps the aperture open longer than the human eye does and we've created this technology. And all of a sudden, now you, you can see something that wasn't there, but it was actually there the whole time. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I, I wonder if maybe when Elisha prayed this prayer, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see that there was actually something even more real than what was in front of him. And that is that God was there. And that the hills were full of chariots of fire that God's army had surrounded the army that surrounded them. And this is what it means to look through the lens of faith. That we get into situations where we feel surrounded, we feel like we are outmatched, we're outnumbered, it doesn't make sense. Here's what it looks like to have faith. This isn't like wishful thinking and I don't know, I just kind of happy, dumb, and lucky and I just kind of go through life and pretend nothing bad happens. That's not what this is about. Faith is believing that even though my situation looks really dark, I trust that God is with me. I just need to look through the lens of faith. That's why I love Psalm 34, seven, such a great verse and reminder. It says, for the angel of the Lord is, is a guard and he surrounds and defends all who trust in him and fear him. That maybe God is actually with you when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death and this is why you don't have to fear evil because God's with you in it. And though it might seem dark, maybe we just have had the wrong lens. What am I supposed to do when I feel overwhelmed and surrounded and I just, how am I supposed to like live with this and how do I, how do I live by faith and not by sight? Well, let me tell you the greatest way to live by faith and not by sight. This is what I have to go back to over and over again. It means that I learn to trust in the promises of God when I can't see how it's gonna work out. If you need something to hold on to, can I encourage you? You need the promises of God. I put some down in the notes, so if you don't have them, you can, you can go there. What are some things that God has promised us with his word? He has promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. That even when we feel like everything is dark and there's no way, God says, I'm with you. I know it doesn't look like it. You've got to look through the lens of faith. He says, I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. I will watch over you. I will protect you. God promises us his provision. That doesn't mean we get everything we want. 
But when we trust in him, he goes, look, I care about you. And my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Sometimes I just trust God is going to be my provider when I'm in a season where I don't see the provision. I don't know what it might be in your life, but I know this, that there is no weapon that will prosper. It doesn't mean there's a weapon that isn't formed, but it will not prosper in my life. This is what we got to hold on to. This is what it means to hold on to the promises of God. Or Romans 8, 28, that I know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So when my situation doesn't feel good, my faith reminds me that God is still working in my situation and he is not done yet. And I know he's going to work something good out of my situation. And when I feel like it's never gonna happen, I trust in Philippians 1, 6, but I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in me, me, is faithful to bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. See, this is why you have to know the word of God because you need the promises of God when you can't see how to get out. There's something about having faith in the promises of God when you're not sure, when, you, when you've messed up, you screwed up so badly, you know what I do? I, I go back to the promises of God, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us and purify us from all unrighteousness. Sometimes I just need to hold on to that because I feel like I messed up so bad and there ain't no way that God would take me back, but then I remember the promise of God. The promise of eternal life for those who trust him. There's so many promises that God has made. And here's what the lens of faith does. I trust God in the middle of my situation. I just feel like maybe God wants to minister that to some of us here today. Would you all just stand with me? I feel like that these kind of moments when we hear a word like we hear from the life of Elisha, I feel like it's, there's something in our spirit that needs to respond. And I don't know if you're here today and I don't know if maybe you are, you're just in a, one of those situations where you feel surrounded. I know it's easy to, to say don't be afraid and it's a lot harder to live. But my hope is that today God would maybe give you a new lens to view life that's the lens of faith. And I'm not gonna trust what I see. I'm gonna trust in what God has said. And so would you do me a favor? Let's just close our eyes for a moment. You know, you know sometimes why in these moments, why in prayer I'll invite you to close your eyes? I mean, you don't have to have your eyes closed to pray. But sometimes when our eyes are open, it deceives us into thinking that's what's real. But when we close our eyes, we have an opportunity to view life through the lens of faith. That's where in my, my mind's eye, I can see the angels and the chariots of fire have surrounded my enemy. When my eyes are closed, I can set my attention and my faith on God and on the promises of God. And so God, I declare right now over every person here, I declare God over every situation, the Lord, that feels hopeless. I, I, I just pray right now for every person in this place, this space, God, that feels like they are surrounded that they don't know how it's gonna work out, they don't know if it's gonna work out. But maybe you came here today, you just feel overwhelmed in life Maybe things have not gone the way you intended for them to go. Maybe that it's a moment like this where God just wants to build your faith to say he's here, that he's never left you. He's always with you. He's heard every cry, every prayer. He has not left you. He's with you. He's not done fighting for you. He's not done in your situation. But maybe in this moment, he's calling us to step into it with faith. Maybe in this moment, he's inviting us to respond in worship and in faith and say, God, I don't know how it's gonna happen, but I believe that you can make a way in any situation. Whether it's a desert, you can bring water. Whether I'm hemmed into the Red Sea, you can part it. But God, we believe that you can make a way where there is no way. Thanks so much for tuning in to this message. I hope that it encouraged you and inspired your faith. If God is doing something in your life, would you take a moment and let us know? We wanna connect with you and we wanna be able to pray for you. All you have to do is shoot us an email to hello at the x.church or you can always send us a DM on one of our social media platforms. And if you know somebody that would also be encouraged by this very message, 
why not take a moment and just share it with them right now. And as always, I wanna say thank you to every single person who so generously financially supports this ministry so we can continue to get messages like these out to people all over the world. We believe God is building something special and you're a significant part of it. Until next time, have a great day.